Hello, everyone, and welcome to a conversation with Kim Marcus, Napa Bureau Chief of Wine Spectator. I'm Ray Johnson from the Wine Business Institute. We're here today to kick off a year. This academic year marks our 25th year focused exclusively on the business of wine. Our educational programs, our research, our events, all focused on the business of wine. And an anniversary year gives us an opportunity to look back and celebrate the achievements and look ahead and see what's next for the wine industry. And today we have a reflection with Kim Marcus, who spent 40 years in the wine business covering the wine industry, and he's seen it firsthand. We've been very lucky over the years. The team at M. Shankin Communications has been very involved in our mission, in our work, and one of those people is Kim Marcus. He's been here on campus to guest lecture in our classes, advise our entrepreneurs, mentor our students. Um, he's made a difference, as so many stakeholders have who've been involved in our mission here. Kim is a native of South San Francisco, and he's been the bureau chief at Wine Spectator in Napa since 2017. He was former, formerly the managing editor based in New York City since 1998 for Wine Spectator. His first job out of school, out of college, uh, when he graduated at UC Santa Cruz in 1981, he started at the St. Helena Star, uh, and that was where he started covering the wine industry. Over the years, as I said, Kim has been very involved, not only with Sonoma State, but with so many of you out there uh, with us today. And with that, welcome, Kim. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Ray. Thank you for those kind words and congratulations on your uh, 25th anniversary. It's, a, it's an amazing accomplishment for Sonoma State and for California wine in, in general. I appreciate that, Kim. And uh, we appreciate the role that you and the whole team at M. Schenken have played. Um, take us back. Um, I wasn't in the, in the Napa Valley in 1981. What, what was it like? How did you get to your start? Well, I, I, I just, I was a, had been trained in journalism and answered a classified ad for the St. Lena star just out of college. Didn't really know where I was going, what, what, what I wanted to do, but there, there were various, um, small town newspapers that had openings. And the one I ended up at was the St. Lena star. Um, it was a very, very small town. I, I, don't, I had only been to Napa once before uh, in my life, though I was a native of the Bay Area, but uh, as many Bay Area folks will attest, Sonoma County is a little more uh, uh, easy to get to and, and easy to understand compared to Napa, which is, even then was a little bit out of the way. It's hard to imagine that's the case, but you know, it's kind of tucked up into the corner of, of, of the Bay Area there. Right, right. And, and what was the valley like back in 1981? It, it was quite a different place in a way, in a way, it, in a way it wasn't. Grapes were becoming dominant, though, you know, cattle grazing, believe it or not, was still a major uh, economic, ma major part of the economic matrix of Napa. Um, there was still perhaps a few pruning trees left. There was still open open areas on the valley floor, hard to believe, with oak trees and, and uh, wow. the locals went hunting for deer in the fall. It was, it was a bit of a little bit of a brigadoon. I don't want to get too, too romantic about it, but it, it was, and it was a bit of a bubble in St. Louis, a very small town. Everybody knew each other or didn't want to know each other. And, and you know, it, it was, it was a very interesting place. Wow. And you had mentioned uh, the Carneros. What was that like uh, back then? Uh, there was very few vineyards. I mean, I didn't even notice any vineyards. Um, I'm sure there were a few. Mostly it was just dairy ranches and hay fields at that point. And watching the transformation of the whole Carneros region over the last 40 years is, is sort of a metaphor for you know how, how grapes have be become dominant in, in Napa and to a lesser extent in Sonoma as well. Right. Wow. And how about the people that you got to know? Tell us about some of the people. You know, back then, perhaps there were 30 or so wineries in the valley, and you got, really got to know vintners and winemakers as neighbors, as members of the community. Really, I got my first introduction to wine, except for 
some priests in my church when I was younger um, by going to the local volunteer fire department benefits. And, you know, it was just all the wineries donated wine at these benefits. So I, I got to taste some great wines in, in the fire hall of St. Helena. And uh, he, he, there was still a lot of white varietals in Napa at the time, Gerberstraminer, Green Hungarian. It wasn't sort of the uh, uh, Cabernet. Cabernet was there, but, you know, it wasn't, was certainly wasn't the dominant, overall dominant grape as it is today. And then there was, you'd see this grape called Pinot Chardonnay and uh, in the local wine store. And that, even back in 1981, Chardonnay was not, not well known and the locals still some of the locals still just called it by its maybe its original french name pinot chardonnay it's very interesting wow and you met some very famous people who may not be with us anymore yeah brother timothy at the christian brothers was always very gracious chuck carpy of freemark abbey uh, mr mandavi of course and mr mandavi as as was used to be pronounced peter Man, peter mandavi um, you know, Andre Chalachev, just, just a magnetic and very kind and gentle soul. And it was great to talk to all these people. And, you know, some of them would come into the uh, newspaper office even. Um, you know, I, 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 I got a special interest on, in Howe Mountain because I had some friends up there who were great growers and got to know Randy Dunn. At that point, he probably may not remember me. He may. I, I still want to run into the people. 40 years later, and we kind of look at each other, and there's a recognition, even though we haven't been that close lately, but, you know, it's, it's a very small valley still. Well, you mentioned Brother Timothy. I got my start at Greystone uh, with Christian Brothers in the mid-80s when they reopened that. I didn't really get to know him. What was he like? He was, he was tall. <laughs> he was, he was uh, he, but he, and he was sort of a, he was a towering presence. I, I think at the time the Christian brothers actually made more money off brandy from their Central Valley operations, but uh, certainly touring, and he was very proud of his corkscrew collection. That was his, that was his big deal. And uh, you know he would show up at events, and it would be Brother Timothy, the head of Beringer, Beaulieu, um, a few other people, and they were kind of the kings of Napa Valley at the time. And I, I do regret that the Christian brothers left left the wine industry because of various church um dick decks i guess but uh, it was it was a nice influence and what were you mentioned louis martini previously and andre chalachev what were they like well louis was uh i toured monte rosa vineyard with him um back it's been in the early 90s and he got into his big suburban truck and it's quite a steep vineyard and you know i, I that was the biggest vehicle i'd ever been in that by that point and he was a very soft-spoken guy um he had a very kind of domineering father so that that's to be understood and uh you know his sister carolyn um was very gracious as well and uh touring the winery there touring his vineyards it was just kind of a hometown you know he grew up in St. Louis, as many of these other folks did and uh, you know it was there it was their home Wow, oh, neat. And what um, what were people drinking back then? Well, you know, there was this grape I always enjoyed called Napa Gamay, which is today known as Valdigue. I think Mandavi made one. People were drinking, um, you know, as I said, the green Hungarian Riesling was very, it was, there were some solid Rieslings. Wow. In the, I don't know whether they were made in the valley at that point, but, the, you know, they were there. Um, Zinfandel was there, and certainly Cabernet. Uh, not not too much Chardonnay at that point. Uh, it was more of red wine, and it was still the era where, you know, the sweet wines I think were may have still been a very important part of the matrix of of wine at that point. Though I, I don't, I never had a sweet tooth for those. So it was a much more diverse varietal mix in Napa at that point, yeah, and perhaps right. cultural mix. <laughs> right, right. It, it reminds me when you're talking about that, um, that we used to, we, we use mostly grape names today, but back then we had, I think BV made something maybe called Burgundy and. Yeah, definitely Gallo did. I remember Gallo made, they had their Mount, Mountain Burgundy 
and that might have been a mix of Central Valley grapes and even Napa grapes. You know, back then, Gallo still, you know, through the co-op, they buy a lot of the grapes. There was a Napa Valley co-op. I forget which winery occupies it now, just south of St. Helena. But when Gallo set those prices for Cabernet, that was the industry standard for Napa Valley grapes. Um, so they were an important part of the mix. And, you know, they, they knew the Mondavis and the Martinis and a lot of, a lot of personal relationships there. Right. Right. And fast forward, uh, either a few years or many, uh, what were some of the favorite stories that you covered? Well, I, when I was at the star, it, I wouldn't call it my favorite, but it was certainly one, one of the most impactful. I, I met a local viticulturalist and they, they had discovered this uh, phylloxera had uh, become, was able to get to AXR, the rootstock that was used in a lot of Napa Valley at that point. And it was in a vineyard just south of St. Helena and it was the biotype B. And, you know, I'm, remember meeting with this viticulturalist and he said, listen, this is just a matter of time at this point. You can just see the radiation of the growth of the phylloxera into the AXR vineyards. And it's just a statistical model at this point as to it'll go through every vineyard. And that, and that's what happened. And, and wow. you know, ironically, that helped revolutionize viticulture in Napa and the entire North Coast. But at that time, it's in the... Um, Jeez, it must have been about 85 uh, or, or so. It, it just seemed to be a, this oncoming disaster at that point. But fortunately, things turned out. So, yeah. And um, you've talked about the California success story. How, how would you describe that? What would you attribute it to? Well, it was, you know, I have to attribute a lot of it to the just the hospitality culture in Napa Valley, you know, opening wineries up, getting people to enjoy wine. Mr. Madabi was, Robert Madabi was very keen, of course, on that. But really, anywhere you went, you could, it was a very egalitarian uh, and very inexpensive way to be introduced to wines, just getting the, getting the word out about wine. You know, Napa was still recovering from the devastation of phylloxera, even through up, through the, up until the early 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, just trying to re re-energize those vineyards, those wineries. There were plenty of abandoned wineries that people were moving into at that point and fixing up. Um, so the hospitality, you know, the growing quality of wine, I think Americans basic pride in a product and probably a bit of the California lifestyle. Certainly California is a cultural trend center and wine being a very important part of that culture helped give a good retro boost to wines, wines increasing role and success. Right. right. And there's been so much success, but some things didn't work out. Some things might have flopped. What, what, what didn't catch on that people tried to do? Yeah. It, you know, there was a movement for these Meritage wines. I, re I remember um, back in the early 90s, late 80s, sort of a blend. Uh, blends still are out there. They just don't call them Meritage, which is fine. You know, back then, there, there were people even then back then trying to do low alcohol wines. They didn't really work at first, but they seem to be picking up speed now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what doesn't work initially probably works, might work later. Um, you know, there was wines in the box back then. Uh, they seem to fade up and now they're coming back. Certainly in, in pursuit of balance had its fits and starts, though I think it has had a a fairly profound influence on many of the wines made in California today. And perhaps the food wine movement of the late 80s, a little leaner style, I, I, that just didn't quite work for a lot of people. And uh, later on, of course, now we have these big voluptuous creamy reds and whites that California has become known for. Yeah, wow. And you mentioned how, you know, box wine, it, it didn't work and now it's hot. Um, and any other was like, was there any canned wine back then? I know that, and that's so hot now. No, I don't, I don't believe so. Yeah, I don't know, box wine, I mean, box wine were some of the first wines I tasted back in, you know, Alban and box wines and whatnot. Um, let's see, you know, wine coolers have faded out, but as I see in your notes, you know, you're asking about uh, 
you know, some of these uh, wine uh, seltzer type beverages. You know, certainly White Zinfandel had a great run and it's still out there, but certainly not the dominant force of, of 30 years ago that it was. Right. And are, are there anything, is there something that maybe didn't stick that you like that you wish would have stuck around? Uh, you know, I, I did like those kind of softer Zins and Napa Gamays that Napa used to make. Um, and they were fairly affordable as well. So right. I, I, I kind of miss some of the affordability factor of Napa these days, frankly. Um, so, yeah. Well, looking at today, um, let's talk about the wine industry today. You had mentioned that um, challenges are certainly there here on the West Coast, but there are also opportunities coming out of that. What are you seeing? Well, I, I think California has great opportunity to, in, to continue to excel in its quality paradigm. Certainly the story of the last 30 years or 40 years has just been the increasing quality spurred by better viticulture, better winemaking, understanding specific terroirs, a movement toward the coast, you know, and an adaptation to what works and what doesn't in various regions in Napa, Sonoma, the North Coast, and the Central Coast has certainly become a driver all the way down to Santa Barbara of quality. So I really, I believe that California is still at the dawn of what it can offer. The only proviso being that the impacts of global warming may constrain those, uh, those frontiers at some point. Right. Hopefully I don't know whether sooner or later. Right. And um, competitive threats. Uh, you mentioned seltzer. Should we be worried about hard seltzer and things like that? I hope not. I, <laughs> I, I, I haven't really, I have to say I've never really tasted one, but I think it appeals to a younger demographic that the wine industry should continue to offer hospitality to, to get them in, get wine culture ingrained into their lifestyle. You want to continually educate people into traditions and joys of wine drinking from an early age. I mean, I bought my first case of wine at the age of 16 <laughs> back in the day when you could do those things. Um, uh, they didn't ask for IDs everywhere, but um, you know, and I think, I, I think, you know, there's been a growing premiumization of the tasting experience in the North Coast, but I, I, I think the wine industry should be a bit careful about that sometimes. You want to get the kids in there drinking, being responsible and being introduced to wine. And, uh, you know, they have student loans. <laughs> Please just give them, a, give them the opportunity to enjoy wines, not, not at a elevated price level. Right. Yeah. If you could share, I didn't realize you bought your first case of wine at 16. What, uh, I mean, we all, we often hear how people graduate into wine, but there you were at 16. Uh, tell me. No, about I was, that. I was a, I was a camp counselor at a summer camp by Occidental and uh, we drank a lot of wine with the priests there. And I had a day off with some friends and I think we slept on the side of the Russian River in Forestville, and we ended up at Windsor Vineyards, I believe it was, which today is Rodney Strong. And, um, and you know, we had tasted wines, and we, I guess I looked a little bit older in my age. I, I, I'm not sure at that point. But uh, it, was, it was definitely a, a bit more laid-back era. There were fewer people, not as much traffic and crowding. And, you know, they were, people were anxious to sell wine. <laughs> legally or not as it turned out right it's cool that you bought a case of wine not a case of beer like many 16 yeah, i didn't like beer yeah i i my my dad drank beer i i didn't like beer actually until uh those hot summer days in 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 saint lena that's first time i drank beer after i moved there because i grew up in san francisco and in, in the area and it was too, too cold to drink beer at that point in a lot of cases, but it, it, it certainly went down 
well on a hot summer's day in San Leno without air conditioning. I can relate. I didn't like beer when I was young either. It took me a while to come around. <laughs> yeah. And what do you think gives wine its staying power? Um, you know, sales and consumption it rise, they, they decline, but yet overall wine carries on. Uh, what do you attribute that to? I think it's a variety of factors. Again, I think it's perhaps ingrained in the California lifestyle that is spread across the country. You know, people, you know, our, our abilities to travel to Europe, except now for the pandemic, probably have introduced a lot of people to the wine culture that, you know, for the East Coast that they weren't, weren't perhaps um, familiar with. Mm -hmm. And also that wine is, uh, the vendors have been kind of smart getting wine in a lot of different entertainment uh, venues. You know, you can look at the Big Bang Theory, for example, and see wine being drunk there. Um, certainly, you know, I, I see you were talking about stories to cover. You know, I remember the French Paradox when it came out in 91, that provided a big boost to wine that we sort of knew at the time, but, you know, had incredible staying power. Um, you know, I think the emergence of Two Buck Chuck 15 years ago really helped to popularize wine. And I just think the, the body of evidence that wine can be part of a healthy lifestyle, you know, related partly to the French paradox helped. And also that the many people love to travel to wine regions and wine regions are some of the most beautiful in the world that, you know, people can visit and enjoy and engage in food. You know, the, the growth of food culture with wine attached to it or wine playing a driving role has helped as well. So I think that the cultural matrix of the country has certainly pushed wine and wine has helped push it as well away from, you know, we, we still drink a lot of beer in the United States, but wine has come into its own as a, as a part of the American lifestyle, at least for certain parts of the country. Right. And on a related note, you've talked about how there's been, in a way, a lightening of attitude toward wine, um, not as stuffy. Could you, could you talk about that? Yeah, I, I think, as I mentioned before, seeing wine in various entertainment venues, you know, the movie Sideways, <laughs> help Pino help, didn't quite help Merlot in the end, but uh, certainly was a popular movie that uh, brought wine in, into people's living rooms or into the movie theaters. Um, I'm sorry, what, what was your... <laughs> yeah, it, it, it seems in, uh, in general, maybe we've taken wine off of a pedestal and made it more democratized. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I don't, you know, the the effete or the, uh, you know, I think the democratization of wine criticism has helped, you know, the 100 point scale has helped bring that about because everybody can relate to, to that scale. Uh, you know, wine, wine appreciation is spread through the internet, most definitely. Um, you know, the, the growing role of sommeliers in restaurants and educating people about wine. Um, and just the vast diversity of, of wines that are available. I, you know, we, I think we talked about this before. I can't think of any other industry that has such a divert, you know, sheer numbers of producers. I mean, the rest of the world is consolidating. You know, the, the wine continues this incredible explosion of, of varietals, wineries, regions. It's just complex and a never ending source of fascination. Perhaps that's also a driving factor that people want to learn about it um, more and more. And there's more and more to learn. Right, right. And um, what do you think really catches consumers attention today? What do you think they want in, in why? I think they want wines that are structured, but are drinkable. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you know, some of those early Cabernets that I drank in the 80s, I mean, they took a while to come around. And, uh, you know, I, I think winemakers have really been working on tannin, man tannin management, uh, both here and abroad. And that's helped to let people relax and say, God, you know, if I buy a good wine, I don't have to stuff it in the cellar for five or 10 years. You know, they, it'd be nice to see wines, you know, improve in the cellar. 
But uh, you know, many of the wines, mo most people, I, I forget the figure, but you know, most wines that are purchased are drunk within a vast majority of wines are drunk within the first week or so of purchase. So the ability to give people immediate gratification is, is great. I, I think it's fine. And certainly there are some wines out there that age, but frankly, I find most wines after a few years, it's, it's kind of hit and miss. So. Right. And, and people do want that uh, more near term gratification and, um, you had mentioned uh, when you travel in Europe, it's, it, there's a different scene there, different customs with wine. Consumers have different approaches. How do you contrast that with what we have out here in California? Well, California, you know, we're kind of on our own little nation state here. So if anything, we're going a little bit towards the European model, whereas for the rest of the country, I mean, most wines, I think, are bought and enjoyed at home. Whereas a lot of wines in Europe, you know, you still have the cafe culture that you can enjoy wines. People are very attached to their regions, especially in France and Italy. Very, very hard to find wines, sometimes wines from outside that region to enjoy. And Americans sort of do that with our wines. And American wines are dominated by California. Um, so I, I think, you know, and everything's been kind of warped by the pandemic. Uh, for good and bad for wine. And, uh, you know, I think people have been enjoying wine at home as they've had to cook at home more and more. But I certainly hope that we're able to go out there and enjoy wine to share with our fellow fellow uh, and our fellows and our neighbors out there because it, it is a social beverage. It should be, it's what brings us together, you know, social beverage since biblical times, if not a, <laughs> the best way to drink uh, fresh water with a tincture of wine in it. Right. Oh, well, thank you. Um, are there, you, know, you spoke of the dominance of California, you know, in the West Coast in general, in the United States, do you, um, do you see other states in, in the United States, like, you know, forging ahead, they're going to be competitors? Oh, oh, certainly. I think, you know, every state in the union now produces wine. Um, you know, I had a friend in Kansas who got married and she had wine, brought in wine from the, the neighboring vineyard. I mean, it was a French hybrid, French American hybrid, but it, you know, people enjoy that wine. They take, they take pride in their local wine culture, you know, from New York to Michigan to Texas, um, you know, Idaho, throughout the Midwest, every, every, every little area has its own winery you can visit now almost. And it's just an amazing transformation that we've seen in wine appreciation. And, you know, as a value added crop, it's great in these areas, especially that are dominated by commodity crops, you know, uh, to, 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 to help pursue that culture. And, and, you know, Canada makes excellent wines. Mexico, our neighbors can make very good wines as well. So, we, you know, even, even across our borders, there's, there's that pride in the land, in the wines, and the people who make those wines. Yes, yes. And there was a question that came in that, that it would be related. So what varieties do you feel are exciting and, and fun, uh, new, something to diversify with, maybe from here or maybe from another place? Uh, you know, I, I still like a good Zinfandel at an affordable price. So I, I think those are still an exciting wine for California. Some vintners may not agree because it been, can be kind of picky to grow. I think Chardonnay is really uh, amping up its quality lately in California. Certainly there's experimentation with other grapes, you know, Tempranillos. I think there's a uh, Grunewald Wiener grown in, in Santa Barbara. Um, you know, some of these Italian varietals didn't quite catch on in California, though Barberas are, are, can still be quite tasty. Yes. Um, but, you know, it's really, California has dominated, you know, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, Pinot, Cabernet, Zinfandel. Uh, and after that, it's just, if you want to try certain things, I still miss some of those old Rieslings that California used to make, but I, I just don't think the economics are there for some of those wines. But more power to the vineyards who experiment out there. Right, right. 
it is challenging because the other, the more popular grapes pay the bills. I mean, they, they work yeah. from a business perspective. Yeah. And, um, you know, um, petite, some, some of the lesser Bordeaux varietals, Cabernet Franc can make an excellent wine, Merlot. Uh, I don't know too many of varietal Petit Verdot, but, you know, they're certainly used in blending. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. It, there was another question that came in that, um, uh, wasn't submitted in advance, just came in. I, I want to see if you want to answer this. Uh, how do you feel about uh, the trend that we see about wineries going public or, um, you know, offering um, shares? You know, I wouldn't call it a huge trend. It, it's, it, there was a movement back in the 90s where there were a few wineries out there that went public. Some of them were kind of glorified wine clubs. Yeah. You know, they paid their shares off in cases of wine, which, you know, works. It, it is certainly a, a, a very yes. difficult formula for wineries to go public uh, just because of the economics. You know, it's, it takes a long time to make money from wine because of the fixed costs of agriculture. You know, you have a facility that, okay, you, you build these beautiful tanks and whatnot, but those tanks are perhaps used for two months out of the year. And the, rest of the rest of the year, they're, they're sitting empty. I mean, it, it's, it, but for those wineries that can do it, um, you know, Duckhorn is the latest example, mm -hmm. uh, probably the most notable example, but uh, that took a long, you know, a long focus by them to get the finances in order to go public, to make them appealing as a public offering. And that's, that's where you guys come in. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have an MBI, so I'm not versed in, you know, the challenges of, of, of the bookkeeping that it required to, for a winery to be attractive and to go public. Right, right. It, it's, something it, to, it's something to keep, keep an eye on, but I don't think it will ever become a dominant or even a, a, a large portion of, of the wine industry in California. Right, right. Um, You've been a wine writer for years and you talked about the 100 point scale and the importance of that to help consumers. Um, the, uh, I remember Marvin sharing once that um, he saw Wine Spectator as a key, uh, it's not just a publication, but it's an educational uh, offering, uh, not only for consumers, but also with the trade. People in the trade are, are learning through the work that you do. Um, talk about the important role that you think um, wine writing plays. I think wine writing at its best can explain the, the, and, and popularize the fairly complicated formula that, it, that is needed to make wine you know, in the cellar and also to grow grapes in the vineyards. It's, it's, there are so many alternatives, there are so many ways to make wine that you know, it's a source of endless storytelling that can be, you know, provide entree to people who are not familiar with wine. I mean, I, I still, I, I try to push the boundaries a bit in my stories saying, okay, this, this quality of this certain wine is based on this certain winemaking technique, but, you know, I don't want to get too much into the weeds of microbiology and chemistry because, you know, I, I have to say, I got to, I barely passed. I, I don't think I did pass chemistry in high school. But, <laughs> you know, that's that was my problem. Um, uh, but certainly, opening up what is basically a, a product of biochemistry and making that accessible to people and and adding to their enjoyment of what they're drinking it is one of the challenges, but also one of the great um, ways of, you know, it's one of the great um, satis satisfactions of wine writing is bringing something to people through a crucible of the printed word that uh, can open doors of understanding for them. And, and how has wine writing changed over the years, or, or maybe for you, how, how has it changed over 40 years? Uh, for me, it's changed, you know, as I've become more comfortable, as I said, with the winemaking process and a viticultural process and listening to vintners really dig down into, you know, talking about rootstocks and clones and, 
you know, fermentation techniques and tannin management. I mean, it's sort of the same story over and over again, but everybody has their own interpretation of it. So seeing what works and what doesn't is a fascinating process. And uh, I, I'm still mystified sometimes. You know, every, every winemaker I've met has been very diligent or seemingly very diligent in, in quality control. But, you know, there's just a simple fact that certain areas grow better grapes than others. You know, certain climates promote better quality than others. And that's not to take away from the hard work of those people who don't have optimal vineyards or, or cellar facilities, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's just, a, there's just thousands of case studies out there and to sift through those is, is uh, <laughs> a lifetime's work. Yeah. There was a question that came in about, about writing. Uh, what would you advise to somebody who wanted to be a wine writer, uh, a particular area of focus, a particular methodology? What, what would you recommend? I would uh, still highly recommend learning how to write journalistically. It's a, it's a good foundation. You have to, you're dealing hopefully with facts in a lot of cases, you have to double check your facts, you know, fact check yourself, become very concise in your writing style, you know, read a Hemingway novel, you know, <laughs> you know but really take ba basic English, grammar, structure, focus, Yes. You know, you need, a, you, need a, you need a solid foundation in those skills that can be combined with uh, your passion for wine. Everybody has passions, but you've got to learn how to, how to focus what you're trying to say and do that as economically as possible. Don't, um, you know, if anything, my, my wine notes sometimes, I almost think they're too brief, but you know, um, or my wine, my wine writing style. I, I like to expand things, but you, you don't want to spend too much time on peripheral topics either. There's a, a related question and it came in. I wanted to paraphrase because it relates to what you just said. Uh, you, you talked about the importance of really, you know, good English, good journalism skills and being concise and getting the writing right. Is there a particular subject matter expertise that would be helpful to have as well? Uh, you know, just learning to talk to people and listening to what they have to say mm -hmm. is important. I think those those go back to my early days in St. Anthony, working on a small town paper, listening to people's, you know, thoughts about the local housing development, you know, that there are both there are two sides to every story or maybe even more sides. To have an open mind, not to be pre not to be judgmental from the outset that, you know, this is you don't journalism is sort of the opposite of the scientific method. You can't really have a theory and, and approach it, you know, to, and find the facts that support your theory. Journalism flips it's on its, on its other flips it in the reverse. You've got to look at the evidence and try and synthesize what's out there. And I, I've always told all my writers, listen, you're not, you're not out there, you know, as a trial lawyer, you're out there as a storyteller. And, uh, the best stories combine fact and, um, you know, also the romance of winemaking and grape growing. Well said. That's great advice. Um, you know, our focus is all on education and our mission is growing leaders in wine business. And I want to ask you again, continuing this thread of advice for the next generation, um, what kind of advice would you give to our grad students? So many of them are already in leadership roles. They come back to work on their wine MBA. Uh, what do you think are the qualities that makes a good leader in wine business today? I think having a solid foundation in, in understanding how wine is made, how grapes are grown, and also the ec economics of running a winery, which I, I know is challenging. <laughs> <laughs> and a source of uh, continuing education. But I also think, you know, being open-minded, talking to people, making them part of a team, um, hearing them, but also drawing the line when you have to, that you're the person in, that has to make the decision in the end, that there is a chain of command. 
but that that it's it's not a total military system hopefully um you know winemaker you know wineries you know they, they certainly have a, a familial feeling sometimes and you know families can be dysfunctional so they're recognized when those those dysfunctions if they manifest themselves in the cellar how to correct those or if there are wrong decisions being made in the vineyard realizing i mean i'm always amazed by vineyard uh, vineyardists to say you know we we planted this grape we wanted it to work but it didn't and we're just going to have to pull it out and to 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 do that to admit failure and to move on is probably key to good leadership one of the keys to good leadership if not the most important yeah yeah you have to take an honest assessment of the landscape yeah and sometimes it's just amazing you know in a vineyard you can see just on the other side of the hill okay this this grape does really well but on this side of the hill it doesn't it may be due to drainage exposure wind it's just it's fascinating just in a matter of yards that, that those those qualitative differences can manifest themselves and i'm sure the same is in the cellar as far as this barrel does better than that barrel. So it's, it's not, you're not making widgets, that's for sure. Not at all, no. Um, let me take you to somebody younger then. Let's say uh, if you were to advise one of our undergraduates, somebody who's 21 years old, they're just starting out. Um, how, do they get out how do they get off on the right foot? Well, I think the, the tried and true formula of trying to get your foot in the door <laughs> any way you can, whether it's as a seller rat or a tasting venue or sales, however you can do it, you'll you'll meet people and hopefully you'll find mentors. And that, I think that's key in any successful career is that young people need to be mentored, need to be apprenticed and, you know, need to have their, well, not their elders, but <laughs> their superiors take the time to, to, um, to bring them along to show them the, the ropes, so show them the tools of the trade and show who to trust and who not and what to trust and what not. And that's just, you know, that, that can be applied to many industries as far as the basic, how you gain wisdom. You gain wisdom through experience, inspiration and hard work. That's right, that's right. And um, entrepreneurs, people who have the dream, they want to build a winery, they want to, well, don't, maybe don't build a winery at, at the outset. <laughs> I've, I've met many great winemakers who that's the last thing they build is there as a winery because the, the, the capital nature of that process is, you know, is fraught. It really is. And, um, you know, you've you've lectured in our entrepreneurship program and, and talked with people who have an idea. Uh, it, it could be a winery. But like you said, most people realize how capital intensive it is. So they look at maybe I'll start with a vineyard or maybe I'll create a brand, a virtual brand. Uh, it's tough. What, do you, what would be your advice? Well, I. I, I would maybe perhaps depending on your financial status, you know, I would say perhaps go to the frontiers of winemaking sometimes, Central Coast, Sierra Foothills, Yolo County, I, Lodi, if you, if you need to. I mean, great winemakers have come out of the Finger Lakes everywhere. You know, places that are unheralded, unheralded it's still the basic process. So we're, wherever it takes you, travel overseas, visit wine regions, take your internship overseas, as much exposure. It's a, it's a fascinating cross-cultural experience. If anything, you know, when I was younger, I wish I had done that more, but I'm, I'm sort of a, a native Californian from way back. So hard, hard to move on beyond the Golden State sometimes. Well, it, it's a beautiful place to live here. Yeah, but it has its problems too, so. And there are other beautiful regions out there. And, uh, it's, it's a whole world waiting to be discovered. Just uh, don't become too overwhelmed by the, by the choices that are out there. Focus on what you want to do, where you want to go, and who you want to be. Right. And it is neat, a wine as a subject, 
you've, you've woven this throughout our conversation. Uh, it, it's such a, there are such a multitude of expressions of places. It, it's a subject that doesn't seem to ever become boring. No. And it, it also helps that, you know, wine is grown in beautiful regions of the world um, from France to Italy, California, Oregon, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, South Africa. It helps that, you know, the grapes, Grapes thrive in uh, a unique geography that is is around the world and it can be enjoyed around the world. Um, as long as you have a fairly dry climate in the summer without, without too much summer humidity um, and, or too much winter cold. You know, it is, it is a, it is a, it is basically a desert plant that it's, it's pretty tough. It's a tough, it's a tough plant. And uh, it can thrive in extreme environments, but not at either end too much. Right, right. Um, you, you've had an amazing career. Um, what, what's next? Uh, where's your next trip? Uh, who are you going to interview? What's, what's the next story you'd love to write in the, in the coming year? Well, we're, we're sort of wrapping up our editorial year. So I've, I've really, that's a good question. I, I should think of what's next. Um, you know, I, I, I think uh, I need to get down to Monterey. Uh, I, I need to explore some of those terroirs in the Santa Lucia Highlands that are promote fascinating pinots. I need to go to Anderson Valley and see what's up there. There seems to be more and more great wines coming in of Anderson Valley. Um, you know, Santa Barbara is certainly coming more and more into its own as a source of quality. Right. Carneros, you know, uh, also... And, you know, your home county, uh, you know, Sonoma County is, is probably the most diverse wine growing region in the state for varietals, for terroirs, um, and for winemaking philosophies. And there's, there's certainly a, a lot to explore in Sonoma that could occupy a lifetime. So, you know, want to get out there as well. You know, okay. Oh, I don't know if we can squeeze this in. And maybe Stephanie could say a word about the anniversary for us at the end. Okay, let me ask. Yeah, that would be great if we could tee that up. Um, oh, okay, here you go. Um, maybe this is a great one to end on. What is the most important lesson you've learned as a wine professional? <laughs> uh, to take your time. To let, to let wines develop in the glass sometimes. To, to not rush to judgment. To, to see, you know, wines can really change the glass sometimes or change in the bottle. And uh, you, you've just got to take it slowly sometimes and not so slowly others. And just to absorb what that wine offers texturally, flavor-wise, structurally, and whether you like, you know, fundamentally like it or not. And putting those all into a, a formula that works for you. Oh, uh, that is great. Patience, it would serve us well in all parts of our lives. Yes, certainly. Wow. Well, well Kim, thank you so much um, for spending the time preparing with us, uh, being here today, sharing 40 years. Um, I, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ray. And I, I hope the harvest goes well this year. We had a tough year last year with the fires, but it seems... Fingers crossed that things are going okay so far in California and Sonoma. So we'll see where it goes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you again. And um, with that, hey, I, I, I appreciate it. Hey, congratulations uh, again on your 25th year. Oh, thank you so much, Kim. Yeah, it, it's a big year for us, a great anniversary. And I want to invite uh, Stephanie, who's been spearheading our um, efforts with the alumni, uh, to join us, Stephanie Peachy, uh, another one of our celebrated alum. Um, you know, there are three distinct advantages for us, and uh, this will tee up what we have coming up in the latter part of this year. Um, we're located, if you haven't been here, we're located on the Sonoma Coast, uh, just one hour literally from the ocean. Uh, we're right in the heart of California wine country. We're an hour north of the Golden Gate Bridge. And San Francisco, as you know, is home to wine commerce on the West Coast. We couldn't ask for a better location. 
And we also have an amazing network of people who help us and guide our direction. The names that you see here represent our board of directors, uh, companies large and small, wineries, people in sales and distribution, suppliers along the entire value chain. And that gives us the guidance to keep the programs and the research on point, focused on the business of wine. Our, our most important, uh, well, uh, um, among our network, uh, also another important group is our alumni. This is a recent group of graduates. We grow leaders in wine business. Uh, this group graduated in 18. Um, and I'll tell you about a few, so you can see the different roles that people are playing uh, after they graduate. So Kate, she's working with Southern Glazers uh, in analytics. Uh, Allie uh, over at Rumbauer, a, a great brand in the Napa Valley, uh, running national sales. Um, we have a lot of winemakers who come through the program now. Um, they know how to make great wine or in vineyard managers who know how to grow great grapes, but they know it's the business level that is the next step for us, for them. And so they get their MBA. And so Gabe making wine with Jackson family. Uh, and then we have entrepreneurs, uh, as we mentioned, that go through the program. Lola uh, and her family building their brand in the Napa Valley. And then Tim Hall, I think Tim Hall may even be with us today, uh, living the dream, working with a great brand, Paul Hobbs, uh, as a brand manager. Uh, these people have amazing careers. And if you have a friend or an employee, a colleague who's thinking about the next step, well, tell them now is the time. We're enrolling for our next cohort of Executive Wine MBA students right now. Uh, look us up online, uh, sonoma.edu slash winebiz. Uh, apply by September 30th if you want to be able to join this group. And this is the first, the kickoff of our anniversary year. Stephanie, we have more things coming up as well. We do. Um, I'll start with Kim. Thank you so much for your time today. What an honor to hear your history and to gain some of your insights. And, and Ray and team at Sonoma State, thank you for hosting this conversation for the industry. I think these are wonderful opportunities for us to get together. Uh, as you mentioned, throughout the next uh, school year, we'll put it on the calendar school year, there will be some wonderful ways to further engage both with Sonoma State and the Wine Business Institute, as well as our industry. So look for more emails. Be sure to follow us on social media, the Wine Business Institute on social media. Uh, Ray is already quietly working in the background and team on a wonderful event to close out the 25th celebration. And also be sure to connect with your fellow friends in the industry and alum uh, to stay engaged and to figure out else, what else is on the calendar. And we look forward to seeing you join us here. That last photo that you saw was of a reception on the South Terrace of the Wine Spectator Learning Center. It would be great to share a glass of wine with you here. All right. Take care, everyone. Kim, Stephanie, thank you so much. Emily Porter, thank you for producing and creating this show today. We really appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.